again. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 835. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's December 19th, 2023. All right, thank you for watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted. I know that's pretense, past tense. You're watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted, and we're glad you could show up. This is our happy place. This is where Kevin and George sit down and find news that we hope that you guys are interested in, in hearing us talk about. And I guess we have a couple stories this week we could talk about. We'll see. George, before we get there, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, the tempo is building. <laughs> Christmas will soon be upon us. And uh, had the pageant last week. We're getting ready for the festivities. Uh, I've got, uh, starting Saturday night, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, uh, eight services by the time I'm done. So i got to think of eight different sermons to, to say. You just don't do copy-paste? No. Uh, by the eighth sermon, anyway, I just sort of stare. Oh, <laughs> it's a <laughs> yeah. plan I'll be in a nursing home because, they, you know, they'll be... Uh, They'll be uh, on my way, Blank there. But uh, right. no, it's it's a great time. No, it is. It's the the holidays are here. Uh, the celebration of Christmas is just around the corner. Uh, I just looking. It's December nineteenth. Have I bought all the gifts I'm supposed to buy? I'm on Amazon here on the side. I'm not going to drive all the way to Walmart or something to buy my gifts. So, uh, it's a new time, George, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because. Uh, one of our news stories just blew my mind. Uh, before I get there, please like this episode. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, there's the, it, it, there's a icon somewhere around there of a thumb. And you click on that and it indicates that you like the program. For us, that's free advertising. You've given us something for free. You don't have to donate anything except a like, and we appreciate that. If you have not subscribed to the program, please click on that red rectangle. Up pops little bell. If you click that bell, you'll be instantly notified every time there is a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. If you have not done so, go to the comment section. The comments were alive this week, and we really appreciate that. There's so many people from all sides of the Christian faith, all sides of the globe, talking about our latest episode, and we really appreciate that. And it's very encouraging that this ministry uh, is is being fruitful in that way. So, George, let me go into the show notes. I'm afraid to cover my eyes. Okay, well, here. I was always told that uh, the Episcopal Church was going to go gay because they went with women's ordination. You know, there's this there's, there's progression. You know, there's, there's no way to stop it. Once you do women's orders and allow women priests to women bishops, your next step is to allow for gay blessings and uh, same-sex marriage and all that. And I said, yeah, I, I get that. I can see the, uh, the trajectory. Same with the Church of England. They said, you know, the Church of England uh, is going to do... The, do that soon too, Kevin, only because they first allowed for women's orders. They said women's orders is that little, it's like the the gateway drug to further heresy. I said, I, I don't know if I buy the complete argument, but I can see that. And so when I opened my newspaper, not really, when I clicked on a link yesterday uh, that said Pope Francis to uh, allow, and this is the headline I read, same-sex blessings, I'm like, well, wait, well, they skipped a step. They, they're missing the women's orders. I was assured that this would only be done in order and that it was safe to join the Catholic Church because they would never go for women's orders. So it was a safe place to, uh, to eat the grass on the other side of the fence, George. Um, what's going on, George? It's a big story. Uh, on Monday, uh, Cardinal uh, Victor Manuel Fernandez, who's the new head of the dicastery uh, for uh, promoting, uh, for the doctrinal section of the dicastery on uh, faith and order, <coughs> or the Holy Office, released a, uh, a uh, doctrinal statement, declaration called Fiducia Supplicans on the Pastoral Meaning of Blessings. It was simultaneously released in a number of major world languages. And 
the the difficulty is that you will get a lot of different responses. There are traditional-minded Catholics who are saying nothing's changed. It's all press and clickbaiting and uh, no, 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 our church has not moved in any way, shape, or form one way or the other. Then you have other equally prominent Catholics on both left and right who are saying a, the, the Rubicon has been crossed and we are now a, a gay-affirming church. The, uh, I just posted a few things on the, on, from the internet that I pulled down, shorting sort of the breadth of responses to this, from Franklin Graham saying, I wouldn't have thought the Catholics would do this, but, you know, maybe we were right all along about the Catholics not being real Christians. I'm exaggerating, but, oh, yeah, you know, but, Franklin Graham yeah. really taking a hammer to Francis. Um, the Bishop of Southwark, Christopher Chesson, who is a, uh, he's a gay man. He's Bishop of uh, Southwark in England. He's a liberal bishop. He put out a tweet saying, isn't it wonderful that the Catholic Church is following our lead? Uh, usually it takes them 300 years to catch up with us on things like liturgy in the vernacular language. Now it's been one day because on Sunday they had the first gay blessings in the Church of England and on Monday the Catholic Church said you could have gay blessings. And then uh, James Martin, the American Jesuit who is sort of the liberal gadfly, was all over, face, all over Twitter and Facebook and social media saying, I can now bless the gay relationships of my friends. And then we have our former colleague, co-host, Gavin Ashenden, basically saying that we are now entering a period of civil war in the Catholic Church. So that's the noise surrounding it. Now, what exactly happened? Well, Cardinal Fernandez put out a 5,000-word declaration on blessings. And it's the, the last time a major document of this sort came out was in the year 2001. So this is not some, you know, press release uh, from the bowels of the Vatican. This is a major pastoral statement of faith and order. And if you go down to paragraph 31, and I've got it in front of me, it says, blessings of couples in irregular situations and couples of the same sex. After laying out a theology of blessings, it the we then take... Uh, which is, I guess I can understand it, it's okay, it's, you know, it's not the way I think, but, you know, it's sort of rational. We then take a Jesuitical turn. What do I mean by that? Well, that's in the old pejorative English language sense of being too clever by half. Now, I'll read this first paragraph, the uh, 31st paragraph. Within the horizons outlined here, all that they talked about are what blessings are, appears the possibility of blessings for couples in irregular situations and couples of the same sex. So after having explained what blessings are, it then says we can now do this for people of the same sex. Then we've got some caveats. They should not be fixed ritually and to avoid confusion that this is the same thing as the sacrament of marriage. So blessings of same-sex unions are not marriage. So that's where the Church of England is. Episcopal Church has already gone out that door into the next room, where <coughs> yes. it's we're into gay marriage. A blessing may be imparted that not only has an ascending value, but involves the invocation of a blessing that descends from God upon those who, recognizing themselves to be destitute in need of help, do not claim a legitimation of themselves of their own status but beg that all that is true, good, and humanly valid in their own lives may be enriched and blessed by this blessing. Let's pause there. Yeah, boy. That, that's so the, the gay couple may ask God to bless what is good in their relationship. Mm -hmm. This is what Sarah Mullally, the Bishop of London, was going on at General Synod. Mm -hmm. When we have blessings of same-sex unions, we're not blessing the conjugal act between uh, the homosexual genital relations we're blessing the love and goodness and kindness between the two and we're not looking at any of the other stuff this is what the catholic church is saying we can pick out the good things in this relationship well you know there were good things in the nazi party there were good things in uh, uh ms-13 the colombian gang there's always going to be good in any human interaction but still 
you know, the Nazi party taught a horrendous ideology and practiced death. Criminals practice crimes. And the Bible is unequivocal that genital sexual relationships between people of the same sex outside of the sacrament of marriage is a sin. So, so we're sort let, of let me stopping that. Let me, let me back up. So you're saying we can bless the friendship of the relationship without blessing the sexuality and eros of the relationship. Yes. And it goes on to say <laughs> that... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. The... The, this is to be a simple blessing. You're not you're not to have standalone services. We don't have that phrase, but it's the same way the Church of England is yeah. doing it. Uh, you're not to uh, get dressed up. You're not to do any of the stuff. Just have a normal blessing ceremony. Um, and a priest can do it without the permission of his bishop. It depends upon the pastoral prudence of the pastor and his uh, congregations. So that's why we're not going to have a right for the blessings of same-sex unions. You just can make it up on the fly. Um, let's see. Uh, such You can do it at a shrine, at a meeting of a priest, and a prayer group. You can do all these things. And why we can do this is because we don't want the church to be negative or cranky or not affirming pastorally. So those who hold to traditional teachings on human sexuality, which the church isn't changing, but those who hold to them rigorously and without tempering them with pastoral care, they're the bad Christians. The good Christians are those who are in a gay relationship that can be blessed and will just bless the good bits of it. Now, well, I'll, I'll pause there. That's what basically we've got here. And this is causing heart failure, if you will, well, across the Catholic world in some cases, and you, joy and enthusiasm in others. And the Church of England's press office is saying, hey, the Catholic Church just stepped on our big day. Sunday was our big day where we're having our first <clears throat> gay blessings, and the Catholics came and ruined it by having a bigger party. There's no way that I never predicted this would happen. You know, I was assured that there was the women's orders firewall be, before they, they they would allow anything like this. It was decades away, and I, I don't mean to harp on that, but uh, you don't put up five thousand words without changing something. Does this mm -hmm. change doctrine? Does this change dogma? Um, and let's step back. This has been unofficially happening at the parish level for 20, 30 years. Uh, now we're just making it official, George. The formal word is no doctrine has changed. <clears throat> no liturgy has changed. Rather, we're having a pastoral response to a perceived need. Well, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, I think it was in 2007, said, what must be shared by the church at all time is the truth. And that if you seek to marry the church to the, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Sure. If you marry the church to the spirit of the age, you are teaching lies. And that is more harmful than sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what the Catholic Church has decided is junking <clears throat> Benedict's way of looking at things, that we must always proclaim the truth in all times and all situations and ex ex exert uh, prudence and fatherly discernment in pastoral situations. My understanding of the New Testament through the Apostle Paul is love delights in the truth. I do not love somebody if I can not boldly tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. I cannot love somebody if I cannot point out where I fail and point out how uh, Christ allows a way forward from my failure into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And to be truthful about that. And well, we, ha 
we had a similar situation, and it's not just the Catholic Church <clears throat> who thinks this way. Much of liberal, Protestant, Christian, and now Catholic theology thinks this way as well. And goodness me, you even have the Greek art, Greek Orthodox Archbishop of the United States being pro-gay. That the, the contagion is spreading. Yes. Last week we had Jane Ozan, who is a lay person, so I'm not holding her to the same uh, standard of rigor that I am holding the uh, prefect for the Congregation of the Faith. She said that, you know, God loves us as we are, and we don't need to repent. We can come to God as we are, and he loves us as we are, and he affirms us. Now, that's not, you know, he's, she's saying you don't have to repent to be saved. You don't have to turn aside from the path of sin. Rather, you just keep walking, and so long as uh, you're looking up at the bright, sunny skies of the Lord, you can keep walking in the direction you're going. Now, of course, we don't believe that in the Christian church. Uh, maybe it's a coincidence, but Ar Arianism, that <laughs> That's heresy that, from the that third, is Arianism. <laughs> that, that, was a, that came from in England, and we're getting it, you know, from Jane Ozan. I don't think she's consciously saying that. She's not, you know, trying to uh, uh, rehabilitate Arius. But what we do have here is, you know, Fitzsimmons Allison on his book, The Cruelty of Heresy, which came out almost 40 years ago. It's as pertinent now as it was then. But no new heresies. These things always come around and come back. And the steps taken here by uh, Cardinal Fernandez and now Pope Francis are heretical. The Pope has stepped away from Catholic dogma. Now, people will say, but he hasn't, you know, changed the liturgy or this or that. Well, he doesn't have to change the liturgy. We're in a place where a Catholic priest, who would have thought that today, if you're a Catholic priest and you celebrate the Latin Mass without your bishop's permission, you can get canned. Or if you're a bishop, like the Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas, you can get canned for being a conservative but you can bless a gay union, bless a gay relationship. So Catholic priests can't sell, you know, where I am, you can't celebrate in this art where we are in Florida, Kevin, the Catholic diocese doesn't allow gay Latin, uh, Latin masses, but I'm sure we'll be on board with gay blessings. I just, you know, I, to think of the, you know, what does the queer community now think, you know, uh, deep in San Francisco where they're, uh, you know, going in and out of multiple relationships a week, you know, oh, we, we can be blessed in this now, you know, we, we can be blessed in our desires. Uh, mm -hmm. We were born this way, and now the Pope says we don't have to repent. Well, it's, I don't want to get all airy-fairy here, but, mm -hmm. you know, the Book <clears throat> of Revelation does say a lot about this sort of stuff, about the... Uh, you know, and the Bible does say a great deal about false teachers and false prophets and people trying to seduce, you know, to curry the favor of the world. Now, Francis is 87. I think I may mention this, but, and he doesn't look to be all there in his recent, you know, he's had health problems, maybe. And Francis has surrounded himself with some really creepy people. Um, Henry Sire who uh, wrote uh, a book about Francis when, it first, when he first was Pope about Francis's behaviors in Argentina, but he was considered a bit of a bully and not very pastoral and, and surrounding himself with compromise and corrupt clerics because he could control them. Francis has never been accused of participating in abuse, but he's allowed abusers to seek his protection, clergy abusers, without punishment. Some of these people have been promoted to France to the leadership of the major uh, Vatican sees, uh, Vatican dicasteries. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, you know, I'm told by some of my conservative Catholic friends that the Vatican has never had a worse top tier. Maybe going back to the days of the Borgia, Borgias. Wow. Well, Fra Francis does this because he controls people who are broken and weak, and you know. The maybe these people see that Francis's days are numbered, and they need to score their triumphs now, rather than uh, wait uh, and do this in the fullness of time after this has been sort of debated and shared and 
argued out amongst the leaders of the church, but instead they just bulldoze this through, yeah. and it's a done deal. I, you know, we joked about it before, but you know, clearly Pope Francis is a Anglican wannabe. I don't know how he's not working within the upper echelon of the Church of England. If you're just promoting the bad and surrounding yourself with people who uh, are failures at what they're doing, and then you take them on as your uh, f flunkies, I suppose. You, is that what we say? You would say flunkies, you know? Well, yeah. you know, sometimes I get a little jealous of the Catholic Church because <clears throat> Francis is like a 9 out of 10 on the Antichrist scale. And Justin Welby's only a three or a four. Uh, <laughs> he's just not that impressive an antichrist as compared to Justin Welby. Uh, now, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, she was getting close to Francis levels. Oh, but uh, but you, you have to ask yourself, why are these two churches, their leadership, moving almost in coordination or in lockstep? Why are these things happening now? And why why is the Church of England rushing into this without any theological groundwork or preparation, but trying to achieve these things, what is, what are they, what, what are they working against? What timeline, what deadline, what's gonna happen? I don't know. Well, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a world without contrast. Right now, we've been raised, I was raised in the 80s, you were probably late 70s, 80s, to see that there's good and evil in the world you, you you read lord of the rings or any of these wonderful books there's there are always two sides if you have in existence a church that does not provide a contrast to the world where's the value of the church there's no there's no value there's no good and evil there's just evil and evil and we've lost that definition of holiness of righteousness of uh grace and mercy and patience and oh joy now, all those things we find in love we've lost the ability to define love love is only eros in in this liberal world it's a little thing that i saw uh one of the papers that came out of the general center of the church of england listed the uh i think it was the 25 churches uh, the churches that had over 100 children in sunday on average and i think there were 25 you know roughly down that many so the less than the Let's just say 25. There are only 25 churches that have 100 kids in them on a Sunday. And of those 25, uh, none were Anglo-Catholic. One was liberal, and the rest were some varying degree of conservative or charismatic or um, evangelical. What's, that's the future. Demography is destiny. And the uh, perhaps I acknowledge that the liberal church is not self-replicating so they've got to seize their victories now um my little church here in hooterville i had 24 kids who were going to be in the pageant so I'd, i wouldn't have made the 100 kid list um that's our future and those children i'm fairly confident have a saving knowledge of jesus christ to the ability that they're able to understand for their age group um, that's the future of the church. And those people who are investing in children in that way are going to be around here when our children are our age. Mm -hmm. No, indeed. Uh, let's move on from some other depressing topic. Uh, oh, here we go. Do, 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 uh, number two. Oh, Church of England. Two women priests who left their husbands are the first to be blessed by the C of E's LLF project. Yay. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. That's adultery, George. Well, two women <laughs> priests were had their relationships blessed at St. John. The, I'm reading the where it was. St. John the Baptist Church in Felixstowe in Suffolk. And their names were Catherine Bond and Jane Pierce. And on Sunday morning, their relationship was blessed under the prayers of love and faith now that we knew this was coming because december 17th was the kickoff date and these were the people first out of the box and they told the media that they were going to do this so the press association and other newspapers were there 
Except it's not a good look. Because as you mentioned, Kevin, these two women, Catherine Vaughn and Jane Pierce, both committed adultery and left their husbands and their families for each other. And they could not be married in the Church of England if they were of an opposite sex. Because just like Prince Charles couldn't get a church wedding because he and Camilla had King Charles and <laughs> Queen Camilla, she was the other she was the guilty party in the uh Adulting, divorce yes case. yeah yeah the church of england i won't do this either i will not solemnize a marriage where i'm solemnizing adultery and so the couple that they've picked as the poster children for this new step forward are adulterers now do i know this for a certain fact no i can only look at the legal uh, divorce proceedings and what their clergy colleagues tell me from England. So wrong, I apologize for this misstatement. And I don't want to attack them because the moral failings, not these two women, no. the moral failings the Church of England's bishop will allow this to take place. So if, so if people who are allowed to become clergy after they leave their husbands for each other, so this took place before they were ordained or during their ordination process, and I'm told all sorts of salacious things about their behavior at an ordination retreat and all this and that, which I don't know if it's true or not, and it really doesn't matter. Yeah. And I feel badly having even brought that out, so I apologize. Yeah, but, that's outside the preview of what we usually talk about. So, But the, 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 point, the point where I'm going is that it's the bishops who have not been guarding the gates. It's the bishops who have pushed this issue out of their world so that a parish priest and Felix Stowe, which before this episode, the only thing I knew about Felix Stowe was that's where Port was. Uh, so a lot of container traffic in and out of Felix Stowe. But I really didn't see Felix Stowe as being an epicenter of religious revival or culture. Now, um, people can do what is ever right in their own minds, in their own places. So you can have a church that's totally kooky in Felix Stowe and down the road in, uh, I don't know, St. Edmundsbury or Colchester, you can have a faithful church. I don't know. Hmm. I don't, yeah. The future is uncertain for the C of E. Let's talk about the Reverend Brett Murphy. He is a former Church of England uh, priest who uh, was, you know, handed a lot of hefty charges and uh, he's coming up to trial. Well, this is an interesting story because it's a political persecution. Uh, Joseph Stalin would be very proud of the Church of England in this case. Brett Murphy was the uh, leading uh, St. David's Church in Colville in Leicestershire. And he uh, was accused of four counts of misconduct. Evidently, there is an archdeacon in the Diocese of Manchester whose name is uh, Rachel Mann. Rachel had once been, a, she was always a man. Yeah, it twins, still is a man. I mean, yeah. But her <laughs> name, the point. his name was Nick yes. and is a transgendered <laughs> person, had had a sex change operation, everything. And in a, uh, in a video pro podcast, uh, Rachel Mann put out prayers to celebrate the coronation of King Charles, which were really airy fairy yes, and yeah. and rather uh, rather pagan in their approach. Kind of universalist church stuff, yes, Unitarian, yeah. yes. And so, a Canon Carolyn Lewis, who is an activist in the Church of England in the Diocese of uh, Derby, Derby, I think. Uh, Put a complaint and there are four charges against uh of uh, brett one that he had misgendered rachel mann by calling him a him instead of her preferred her he was engaging misconduct S second he criticized her prayers uh for the coronation which he said were more witchcraft and where rachel mann described jesus as our sister uh, Brett Murphy said, no, 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 that won't do. Yeah. That was a crime. He then expressed concerns over the teaching of marriage and human sexuality in UK schools in a sermon. 
So the, Christ, uh, the sex education he thought in British schools was horrific, which it is. And the fourth, he was accused of not visiting a former member of his church who was in the hospital, uh, even though he didn't know that this guy was in the hospital. A little fight, now, lots of stuff, yeah. You know, I have to, anybody who's ever been a parish priest will know that they don't know half of what's going on out there. You've got people in the hospital. i got people in the hospital right now I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. So these four things were brought up, and the Bishop of Loughborough, Saju Muthalale, who's the Suffragan bishop in that diocese, uh, heard the case and decided in favor of Brett Murphy. Not guilty. Well, Carolyn, and then in July, after all this was done, Brett Murphy left the Church of England and is now a Free Church of England minister in Morecambe, up, which I think is up in the uh, north uh, west area of England. Middle of nowhere, yes. <laughs> Middle of nowhere. Um, then, after, then in October, Carolyn Murphy filed an appeal. And she found a church attorney who went over the bishop's ruling and she's, and the bishop and the attorney said that, uh, well, the bishop was right in three or four of these things, but Brett Murphy was wrong to call Rachel Mann a woman. And by misgendering him, he had committed a clergy misconduct. So that's where things are, uh, lay right now. The case is going to be reheard by Bishop Mulalafi and but see brett murphy is no longer in the church of england so here's the situation Brett murphy doesn't have to respond to this it's you know it's not his church he has nothing to do with it but if a default judgment is entered into against him what happens well it has now been shown under church law that if you call a, uh, a transgendered person anything other than their preferred pronoun you are violating church law it's called so precedent this, this, yeah, this is a backhanded way to manipulate and get a political victory for the transgender, transvestite community mm -hmm. out of a case that shouldn't have been brought <clears throat> anyway. It's a political prosecution. Sure. Now, Bishop Lilothi can rule again in favor of Brett Murphy, but he's already had legal advice that he was wrong. But we've reached the point where lies are now considered truth and truth is a lie rachel mann is a man he has the chromosomes of a man he may have had surgery to remove the exterior vestiges of his masculinity and he may take hormones and he may dress a certain way and he may consider himself to be a certain way but that does not just change his essence or entity Mm -hmm. or how he was created yeah and there you go he was created to be a man okay now we've had probably at this point hundreds of thousands of same-sex surgeries trying to change the gender or sex of people not one of them has been successful in changing a person's sex because it can't be done it, it, it is at a chromosomal level um that god has made you who you are it's not just the the images. It's not just the reflection you see in the mirror. It's the essence of who you are, including your soul. Sorry, had to say it. So, <clears throat> so we're, we're at a stage where the uh, Church of England, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church of Canada, Canada, England, the United States, other European nations are trying to impose by lawfare that which biology science and human reason says is wrong so we, we've got you know we've got you know a man cannot become a woman a woman cannot become a man those biological facts and you know you go from an atheist like richard dawkins who's in trouble for saying that to a liberal uh, political liberal like uh, jk rowling to old cranky people like george and uh, kevin and now brett murphy who's young Bruce, Bruce Jenner uh, or Caitlyn Jenner Bruce, yeah uh saying that they can't you know they can present themselves in a certain way but does that compel me to respond mm -hmm. must I play into their if you will madness now Brett's an Australian yeah you know Australians are pretty rude uh <laughs> well they're blunt 
And maybe his Australian temperament's gotten him in trouble and stayed stodgy old England. Who knows? But the Church of England is seeking to institutionalize lies. They've all they've done this already. That the whole conversion therapy business. You know, the, the studies at you know we put it in something on Anglican Inc. this past week. In the United States, it's been around long enough that the 26 states that have forbidden conversion therapy see higher rates of suicide among people with transgender identity issues than those states that allow conversion therapy. What does this show us? That conversion therapy reduces dramatically the incidence of suicide. Well, what's the talking point among the liberals? Oh, we're driving all these transvender, transvender people to suicide unless you go along with what they say. The science tells us the opposite. So this whole conversion therapy is harmful. That's a lie. Men can be women. That's a lie. Um, we just start down this whole list of, of lies uh, that we are now being forced to live with. Um, and the, and the church has accepted it. The church has uh, heard the the wisdom of Satan, and that they are pondering: Did God really say that? Mm -hmm. Oh my Lord! You know. Yeah, you know, the you know we are now to believe that the Bible, Saint Paul, is a liar. He was wrong. He didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't understand the world. He he just was uh, some Jewish zealot, um, and the Bible is wrong in all those places that it states that homosexual homosexuals will not active homosexuals will not be welcome into the kingdom of god the bible's wrong about that 2000 years we've had it all wrong that's you know that's another lie that is being seeming to be institutionalized and now the catholic church going back to our first story is saying we don't have to pay attention to the bible all we have to do is try to be nice. Well, I think the Catholic Church says we can bless the 10% and ignore the 90%. And that's, that's good enough. Well, but by ignoring the 90% and not calling people to repentance, what good is the blessing of the 10? What good is the liturgy? I mean, geez, I mean, holy cow. I mean, our liturgy is about calling us to a time of repentance so we can come to the table and have a Eucharist with the Lord. I don't know. I don't get this. But it, I mean, you're throwing out, like you said, 2,000 years of doctrine uh, so that people won't be mad at you. Let's move on to the news. There must be some good news out there. Let's see. News story number four. Shepherd Cathedral is being extorted by climate gangsters. Gangsta. Coincidentally, without yes. any <laughs> response to anything, Sheffield Cathedral is dropping Barclays Bank. Uh, what? Now, you, re <clears throat> you remember climate, uh, Christian Climate Action said that they're going to start days of rage in the cathedrals of England who do business with Barclays Bank because Barclays Bank has investments in the uh, petrochemical industry. But that's a bad thing. And we've seen all the crazy stuff they do. <clears throat> Uh, and the last two weeks ago, they burst into Chichester Cathedral and interrupted a worship service. And without, you know, it's just amazing how, how farsighted the dean and chapter of Sheffield Cathedral were, where they came to their own independent conclusion that maybe it's time after 40 years that we change our banking relationships. Kevin, I call this extortion. <laughs> I mean, nice well, cathedral you have here. Too bad if something would happen yeah, to it. You know, come on. Me and Tony were looking at the cathedral. You're thinking, you know, I wouldn't want to drop a match over there. Yeah, yeah I know. It's this is this is gangster politics, um, which okay. Since my observation, this is what the Rainbow Coalition used to do here in America. This is certainly you know what the climateistas around the world do is try to say, hey. We, we see you have a large carbon footprint. You don't have to reduce your carbon footprint. You just have to pay us for your carbon footprint. Yeah. Now, see, well, Jesse Jackson used to do that in the United yeah, States. He'd yeah. go around and shake down corporations. Remember that? Oh allegedly. Gosh. Allegedly. Uh, that's right. Hey, uh, if you're watching, Jesse, we're good, okay? You know. Yeah, we're good. 
somebody who looked an awfully lot like Jesse Jackson would go to these major corporations and say, unless you gave money to Operation Push or whichever organization I'm running at this time, we'll start uh, trotting out the racism card and, and picket you and this and that. And uh, Mark, the Christian Climate Action are now doing the same thing, except I don't think they're actually shaking down these people. They just want to achieve ideological uh, purity. Yeah. All right. Interesting story out there. Let's see. This is going to be the last story. The Society has a new leader. I don't think most of our audience knows what the Society is. Let's talk a little bit about that. The Society under the patronage of St. Wilfred and St. Hilda, acronym is SWISH, which is unfortunate in American context because SWISH is a... Um, Swishy? Uh, yes, that's what you call a... Uh, gay person or homosexual but maybe they didn't have that in mind when they came up with that name That's right. so uh it's uh i have to say you know, elon musk's new university texas institute of technology and science its acronym yeah <laughs> Don't. No, he did that. <laughs> he, 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 he did. He, that's his joke. That's, okay, his, right. that's what he's going to. That's his joke. <laughs> okay. okay. We have to. Okay. Moving on to the story. <laughs> yeah. We got into this because Norman Banks, a bishop of Richborough, who is one of the provincial episcopal sitters uh, for the province of Canterbury, he's doing the eastern half, is resigning, stepping down after ten years. And some of you, many of you, most of you will go, "Who? What? What was he doing?" Well, that's been his impact. He's been a placeholder. And the whole Anglo-Catholic movement's a bit of a mess institutionally in the Church of England. Um, Jonathan Baker is now the new president of the society uh, under the patronage of St. Hilda and uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Wilfrid and St. Hilda, whatever. It's under the society. And Baker is the Bishop of Fulham. Now, Baker is a controversial person. In that, Baker uh, was the bishop who was a Freemason who agreed to become a bishop in exchange for dropping being members of his Freemason society. And then ever since, there have been rumors that this was just public. He's never quite, you know, given up his secret uh, membership because he was the very top of British Freemasonry. And second, he was to take care of bishop, uh, clergy in the Diocese of London who didn't want uh, women, you know, who disagreed with women clergy, who held to traditional values like uh, divorce and remarriage was wrong. And then Bishop Baker got divorced and married the wife of one of his priests. So the bishop given to conservatives in London is divorced and remarried, but has an ex-wife living and her, his wife has a husband living who's a clergyman. <coughs> Baker also, when we had some of these committees, uh, voted with the liberals in support of the gay agenda. He's now head of the society. Paul Thomas is now head of Fordham Faith. He's one of the new provincial visitors. <coughs> Don't know much about him. But what it does tell, and you know, Martin Warner, who's a member of the society, uh, his diocese, Chichester, sponsors pride festivals and all sorts of things are said about his personal life. And the problem is, you know, I was talking to Richard Broadhurst a few years ago. He was the former provincial Episcopal victor, and he was a rather robust, more of a Fort Worth type Anglo-Catholic. Yes, he was, yeah. And uh, very robust. And uh, his point was uh, that uh, the Anglo-Catholic movement in England was dying and had at the upper echelons it still was holding fast on women, but it totally surrendered on the gay business and wasn't going to condemn uh, the strides towards on homosexuality because a number of its leading figures were themselves gay. So they were happy to say no to women, but all in on the innovations on human sexuality. And so we've now reached the point, according to Richard Broadhurst, when I last talked to him, that the Anglo-Catholic movement, you know, get out while the going is good and go to Rome. Now, what would Richard Broadhurst say yeah, after Monday's say, news? I know, yeah, that, that bridge is gone. I mean, is there any safe place to go? Yeah, Central Florida, Kevin. Central, Central Florida, Florida. Central Florida. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
just crazy. But now, I mean, the, the, sad, I mean, the, sad, the sad thing is, is that there's always <sighs> it, not so much in the United States. In fact, hardly at all. But you know, in the United States, there's really no uh, conflict or differentiation between Anglo Catholics and Evangelicals. I mean. I've always had excellent relations with Keith Ackerman and uh, Jack Eicher and the next generation of Anglo-Catholic leaders, and they know exactly where I'm coming from and who I am and what I, st what I believe in. And our relations have always been good, respectful, kind, loving, wonderful. I feel very welcome in that, those circles. Oh, there are wonderful bishops, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In England, that's not true. In Australia, that's not true. Um, I've heard Australian bishops, I heard Peter Jensen doubt the salvation of Catholics at one point, you know, because of their uh, errors. I mean, some of the Reformation junk is really held all in longer places. Maybe because in the United States we've been, been beaten up for so long, we find uh, friends in the strangest places. But in England, uh, the Anglo-Catholics blame the Evangelicals for the general synod vote to allow women clergy. They feel betrayed. And now the uh, Evangelicals feel betrayed by the Anglo-Catholic groups on general synod for not standing with them on the homosexuality issue. Some did, but not all. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Broadhurst at one time wanted to have a consultation on homosexuality, on human sexuality within the forward of faith in the Anglo-Catholic movement. And the other people said, no, 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 we're not going to touch this. We're just going to focus on women and liturgy. And the, and the reason was, was too many of our constituency are themselves gay. So i don't know what the answer is kevin except faithfulness personal faithfulness and holiness while the world falls apart around us well i mean the answer clearly is christ and the answer is you know the church has gone through these bumps and bruises before uh does do we need a you know i don't know what we need because that's above my pay grade but i think we need a church within the roman catholic church the orthodox church the anglican church the lutheran church the episcopal church that is willing to repent and return to the, the the faith that we were that was brought to us by the patriarchs through scripture. Uh, I don't know. I you just it drives me crazy. But I'm a big picture guy, George. I can see how God can redeem this. If I were really really focused up all the way down to you know the, the shoelaces on Pope Francis's shoes, I I would not understand what's going on. As I back up my camera. And, and get the big wide zoom, I can see how God can redeem this and make a bigger, stronger church. It may take a while. Now, it won't happen with the current leadership, of course. Now, let's talk age. Michael Curry, aging out. Will he make it to the next general convention? Uh, it's time to for the uh, Episcopalians to pick a new leader. Uh, Foley Beach is going to be uh, re, uh, retiring at the next uh, uh ACNA provincial event. Uh, Pope Francis, he's old. He's just gonna uh, maybe retire, step down, or in a a typical Pope uh, transfer power. Uh, I don't know. Justin Welby's got two, maybe three years before he oh, ages. That's out. a long time, George. I could do with about three more months of Justin Welby. If he wants to retire, I I would I would send an envelope with a thank you, a little gift. Goodbye. You know, I don't know. Uh, there was a little confusion last week. George and I talked about how neither one of us had been bullied by the Episcopal Church. Some people took that to say the Episcopal Church has never bullied anybody. That's not what we're saying. We were just saying in our personal experience with the Episcopal Church, uh, we were never bullied you know, Bishop uh, Lawrence could tell you all about bullying. Uh, uh, Bishop Love, Bishop, we just Ackerman, he could tell you. I mean, he went through a uh, medical crisis trying to deal with the bullying he was getting from Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and uh, uh, 815 at the time. Yes, the yeah. Episcopal Church does bully. We did not receive it. And I don't think the culture of bullying is as pervasive in the Episcopal Church as it well, is in the Church of England. Absolutely. And we were trying to do a, a comparison. If you think the Episcopal Church is bad, 
Look at the, the, the Church of England, absolutely. Well, in, in my, somebody mentioned my particular circumstances. Um, when I was in seminary, I was an ordinand from the Diocese of Pennsylvania. I was also to graduate from Yale, and I had a job at Grace Church on Broadway in New York City, which was uh, Fitzsimmons Allison and Paul Zoll's, Paul Zoll's mm-hmm. old parish. It was the evangelical conservative parish in New York City. And I was all signed up to be their curate. And then in May, before my June ordination, the new uh, bishop, uh, coadjutor, was named Charles Benison. He had me down and he told me that I was an arrogant evangelical and that uh, he didn't understand how an intelligent man like myself could believe in the virgin birth and the literal resurrection and all these Christian doctors. Wow. And so he declined. He said, I'm not going to ordain you in May. And he had been given the charge of ordinance. Well, when I got home, I talked to my mother, who was on the standing committee of the diocese, and I talked to my pastor. uh, And they said, uh, let's make some phone calls. And so I called Fitzsimmons Allison, and he said, we'll call Bob Duncan in Pittsburgh. And I called Bob Duncan in Pittsburgh. Mutual friends called Bob Duncan. And Bob Duncan called the bishop in Philadelphia and said, well, won't we do a swap? I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I've got a liberal ordinand who I'm uncomfortable with, and you've got a conservative one, and why don't we just swap? It took a year, and so I had to spend a year as a uh, CPE chaplain at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, but I prevailed. And at the end of the time, Bob Duncan came to Philadelphia to ordain me, and the liberal, who was actually a classmate of mine at Yale, was ordained by the bishop in Philadelphia, Charles Benison. Now, you could say that was bullying, but <clears throat> I didn't take it personally in the sense that I knew that uh, this was all, you know, Benison's politics. Sure. And, you know, Benison came and did a pastoral visit to my our church, which was Good Samaritan and Paoli, and during the middle of his sermon, my father got up and started, said, you, sir, are a liar. Leave this mm-hmm. place. You are not a Christian. Wow, and of course, and of course, the uh, the rector went, "Oh my God, Oliver!" <laughs> but if I were bullied, that means I would have been fearful, and I was never quite fearful. Um, now, I've not, I've been told half a dozen times early on in my ministry, I was not welcome in dioceses. I had a job in uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale as an assistant. I was hired. I went down to see the bishop, and the bishop said, oh, you're that fella. Sorry, uh, I'm not going to give you a license. So I got my car, and I drove to Orlando, and Bishop Mm -hmm. Powell said, well, I'll give you a job. And that's how, now you could call that bullying, but I never felt, I just felt that, you know, this was God's plan. These were God's tests. I had to persevere if I believed in what was true, because it wasn't a job. Mm -hmm. And I was never actually physically afraid of anybody. I was mad as hell, but thats I don't consider that bullying. See, the things I talk about bullying are the personal animosities and hatreds that just sort of destroy yourself from the inside out. I don't know. That's me. Well, that's you. I mean, uh, in 2004, 2005, 6, 7, I was the uh, uh, internet provider for the Diocese of Connecticut, Episcopal in uh, in Connecticut. And uh, I was a young entrepreneur at the time. And when they discovered that I was in charge of Anglican TV, they kindly asked, you know, can you help us change this relationship? We don't need, want a business relationship with you anymore. I said, that's fine. I understand completely. Uh, her name was Karen Hamilton at the time. You know, sent me a nice email, says, you know, we, we need to sever this relationship, obviously. I said, I understand, you know, and I helped them move to a different service and stuff. And I was not bullied, mm-hmm. you know, so. And you were dispossessed from your church in Thomaston. My rector was bullied. My rector was one of the original Connecticut Six um, rectors. His name was... Uh, um, uh, Benedict, Father Benedict at the time, and uh, he was bullied, and his health took a, a hit like nobody's. Uh, there were several, uh, six different rectors who 
uh, went up against the Episcopal Church in 2006 over uh, then uh, the bishop went and had uh, participated in the consecra consecration of Gene Robinson, and they wanted to hold him accountable. I guess you have to go back even further, 2003. Sorry. When was that? The consecration was 2003. 2003, right? 2003 yeah. Yeah, geez. The, the cobwebs of my memory in this ministry are just crazy. 2003, and it just took years for that to play out. So 2004 and five uh, were when the Connecticut Six formed. And that was just a long time ago. But I had a business relationship with the diocese, and they suffered it, not because they're bullies, because they just did not want to financially support, you know, the future Anglican TV. Got it. No problem. Got it. So so there is bullying in the Episcopal Church. Um, just maybe, Kevin, your my temperaments are such that we don't recognize what for others would be bullying. No, but I, I do recognize when others are bullied. Uh, I mm -hmm. think what happened to Bishop Love is bullying. I think it would happen mm -hmm. to, to Lawrence and uh, even uh, the uh, Florida uh, elections. That's bullying. Charlie uh, Charlie uh, Holt. Holt. You know, of course there's bullying in the church. We were contrasting that versus the Church of England where it just, it's... It's in the water. So. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so much worse. But yes, does the Episcopal Church bully? Of course it does. If any channel, if any YouTube channel has ever covered the bullying of the Episcopal Church, it's Anglican TV. We, we have it all documented. You know, it, it's crazy. Just watch the first 834 episodes of Anglican Unscripted. That's all I get you. Well, you know, Kevin, you know, I've called, uh, when Catherine Jeffersori was presiding bishop, I've pointed out when she lied. I, you know, you and I pointed out her lies, false sure. statements, mistruths, her th heresies, mm -hmm. her sermon in uh, <laughs> with Paul on air, Curacao, where <laughs> Paul was wrong to cast out the demon. Now, oh bullying gosh. would mean that there's a system that could squash George Conger. I could be, you know, nothing ever happened. Maybe it's because we're so inconsequential they didn't bother. Well, hold on. But, uh, I, I would find it would be very difficult for you to reach the office of a purple shirt in the Episcopal Church because of your role here on Anglican TV. And I, I would say that would be difficult in any other diocese except your own. Yes and no, because I don't need to talk to people in the purple shirts because there are other people who talk and say more. <laughs> well, I'm just saying you couldn't uh, become, a, it would be difficult for you to be a bishop. Oh yeah, well that, that ship sailed. Yes. All right. Hey, this may be our last episode before Christmas. Uh, for those who you who want something else, I have recorded a quick interview with the Reverend Brett Murphy. I'll put that up on Thursday. I hope you guys will enjoy it. Uh, but listen, we're taking Christmas week off. George is busy. I'm busy. And we wish you a very Merry Christmas, all of you. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 835 of Anglican unscripted.